I grew up in California in uh, Orange County. And right around the tail end of high school, uh, beginning of college, <clears throat> I was experimenting with drugs and I realized specifically that opioids, uh, painkillers, uh, made me feel a certain way that I had never felt before, you know, and it felt like it was something that I was missing my whole life, you know, and it, it was not very long from that point until I was in, you know, the full grip of, of an addiction. Um, and, you know, that was, that was a solid, uh, few years of my life, um, until I got sober. Uh, I, well, I started trying to get sober, uh, in, in about 2011 and it was still a few years, you know, of, of really wanting to get sober, but, uh, not underestimating how much effort that would take, you know? And, um, I ended up uh, getting sober three and a half years ago and graduating from college and, and getting work as a content writer. And so it's been uh, very rewarding, but uh, definitely a, a tough road. I was doing some community service. I had got caught buying alcohol with a fake ID when I was like 19 or, or so. And I remember it had been after a, a stretch of uh, using oxycodone every day for a while. And this one day I was, I was out on the side of the freeway picking up trash, doing community service. And I realized that I, I just felt terrible, like flu symptoms. And I simultaneously realized, that, hey, this is the first time I haven't used pills uh, for a whole day for a while. And my brain immediately drew the connection. And I said, oh, wow, this is my life now. You know, like this is, this is my ball and chain now. And uh, it was, a, it was, that was a really scary moment, you know, and and that fear of withdrawal was something that became a massive hurdle in my getting clean for the rest of my time using, um, because it's 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 extremely uh, you know painful and 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 difficult to get through that. Now my struggles look a little bit different. Um, I struggle with relationships. I struggle with uh, work. You know. I, I struggle with money. Um, sure, I have cravings once in a while, um, but what that type of struggle looks like at three and a half years sober is a lot different than what that type of struggle looks like at three days sober or three months sober, you know? Well, I went to a high school where drugs were sort of around. Uh, I don't know what the other high schools in the area were like or... Uh, but I, I, I always had a pretty easy time uh, finding other people that were experimenting with drugs. And, uh, you know, in the high school and early college times, it was there was still a sense of innocence a little bit about it, where I, I maybe didn't realize how serious the things that I was experimenting with were. And um, it, it, it was it was quite a while after that of you know, meeting people that were serious drug dealers, uh, getting connections from other dealers or other people that used. And it, it was sort of a road from that to going online to try and find it. I first heard about Craigslist because I saw it on the news that there was people selling drugs on Craigslist. And my immediate thought was, wow, that's a really dumb thing to do. Who would put their information out like that, not even encrypted, uh, with no, no sort of privacy, um, or protection against, you know, law enforcement and stuff. But, uh, you know, the thing about, uh, opioids, uh, and, and other drugs similar to it is that once you get addicted, you can't really stop. So if your supply runs out, you're going to start getting real creative at ways to find your fix. And that's sort of what it took for me was not, not being able to find it through my traditional means of you, my usual dealer or going to downtown LA or, you know, finding it the, the way that I usually could and starting to get sick and thinking, well, you know, now that I, now that I feel you know, absolutely terrible. Maybe that Craigslist thing doesn't look so bad. And uh, you just get desperate enough to want to try it. And, 
you know, the, the way it really gets its hooks in you, specifically this issue, is that it's a, it's a matter of extreme convenience. You know, it's, it's totally anonymous. You don't need to know anything about these people. They don't need to know anything about you. You respond to an ad online and you, and you pick up whatever drug it is that you're looking for. And that, that was one thing that made it incredibly hard to walk away from, too, was knowing how easy it could be to get that fix again. There was not one time where I went to buy or sell drugs with, with someone that I met on a Craigslist ad and, there, and, and drove to it without thinking, in half an hour from now, I could be getting high and feeling great, or a sheriff could be walking me through the front door of the county jail. You know, it felt, it really felt like a 50-50 shot every time I did it. And that also speaks to the desperation of the addict, of what you're willing to do when you're in that place of, you know, absolute dependence. And, and, and you'll, you'll do, you know, whatever, even, even risk arrest to, to, to get what you feel like you need. And so anytime I was selling something on Craigslist, I tried to be as subtle as possible to disguise words, to use slang, uh, to give as little information as possible. Um, obviously, never give your name or location. But, you know, I, I truly think that if, if there was any law enforcement at any time that really wanted to find someone selling on Craigslist, they could find them. There's no amount of disguising your name or, you know, hiding your location that, that they can't get around. Um, but the thing, about, the thing about this stuff too is that, especially when I was selling, it's only something you need to worry about for maybe a couple hours because the second you put that ad up online, hey, I've got X amount of whatever, um, people are immediately getting in touch with you and you're sold out of it pretty quick and then you can just delete the ad and act like nothing ever happened. I don't think that this, I don't think Craigslist is the problem. I think Craigslist is a symptom of the problem because, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like that myth of the Hydra, the multi-headed dragon. It's like once you cut off one head, then the other one grows back. So, you know, maybe, maybe we can get good monitoring of Craigslist and get good law enforcement involvement on Craigslist and people stop using Craigslist as a way to get illegal drugs and potentially hurt themselves. But what about Snapchat? What about WhatsApp? What about Facebook message, you know, or, or any number of other places that could pop up and potentially be an option for these people, you know? That's the big problem to me. What do I think the fix is? Well, you know, it's it's really hard to say because we've never really faced anything quite like what we're facing right now. And we can see it on smaller scales in countries like the, like the Netherlands where um, they have great harm reduction and decrim decriminalization programs. I believe in, in Holland it's called the Rainbow Clinic where you can just go get a fix of heroin and they'll shoot you up. And I think uh, the Netherlands has like 25 million people and something like 10,000 heroin addicts, which is pretty good numbers uh, compared to a city like Baltimore here in the United States, which last time I checked the CDC numbers had a population of like under 700,000 and close to 60,000 addicts. So that's like 10%, you know? So I would like to think that some type of harm reduction or, um, decriminalization method of, of rather than criminalizing the addict and chasing them into alleys and putting handcuffs on them, maybe we can like get them out into the open and talk to them about wh what's a way to move forward. And, and, and rather than giving this to the cartels and the black market, we bring it out in the open and we, we try to find a viable method of counseling and, and whatever else we can do to help these people rather than treat them like criminals. I mean, it's hard to say, it's, it's, it's hard to say where anything's going with the internet because I think there isn't anyone among us that's not surprised with how far it's come and, and what's changed. I, I don't see, what, one thing I don't see is I don't see law enforcement suddenly getting involved and getting everything under control. Um, 
you know, I mean, here, like, I, I moved to Salt Lake City, and uh, Craigslist isn't really used here. They have, like, the KSL uh, classifieds, which I think that they have a little bit of an easier time moderating and keeping it from getting out of hand. So maybe that's that's the solution is treating this at a local level rather than trying to get a whole big entity like Craigslist or Facebook or Snapchat to control the problem. It's hard to say though. Certainly I think it's, it's, it's something that we should be putting resources towards because I've heard entirely too many stories about people overdosing and dying and then their uh, family member looks on their phone and realize that they had just bought whatever they had purchased, you know, online. And it seems so preventable. It seems like something that we could so easily intervene and help with. Um, and in many cases, I think it's, it's just uh, ignorance that causes it to uh, not be acted on. So yeah, absolutely. I think it's something that that would be good to devote resources to because you know this is this is here this is something that's going to stay i don't think this is a phase i don't think this is something that's going to go out of style and people are just going to stop doing you know it seems like something that's only increased in in the years that it's been going on it, it was a higher uh ultimatum for myself than just buying or selling it was it was that if I don't stop using, I'm going to die. And and that was evidenced by, you know, the 13 or so friends that I've seen die from this and and the stories I read about it every day and just seeing where my life was going, ending ending up in rehab, ending up in jail, losing jobs, getting into car accidents, you know, just utter chaos and misery and and really knowing that the way that I was trying to go about changing or fixing my life wasn't working and that it was, it was really time to give up and try something else. I mean, I was caught doing other things and I think that to a certain extent, uh, that type of punishment can definitely be a motivator for someone to stay out of trouble. And I think that you can change your life from getting arrested. Um, but I think in most cases, long-term sobriety has to come from a more personal place than that. It's you, You're probably not going to stay sober your whole life just out of fear. You probably need to address some more uh, intimate personal problems. Uh, that you have with yourself in order to really keep and enjoy uh, long-term sobriety. You know, I talked to a uh, a U.S. Uh, Army veteran one time, and he was telling me about how at that time, you know, there was a lot of heroin coming from Afghanistan, and there was troops dying over there, and and there's a clear connection, you know, and and thinking about the fact that like I'm over here shooting up while these guys are trying to die or, or are dying to defend my rights. Um, that, that really hurt me, you know, and, and seeing, seeing people pass, I, I went to the funeral of a 19 year old friend that overdosed a couple years ago. And it was like, he, he never had a chance to really live his life. You know, <clears throat> he went to high school, he graduated. And he, that was pretty much it. And <clears throat> knowing people like that and meeting the parents of people like that, I think really, really changes your perspective. And 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 maybe money isn't the most important thing in the world. If if you're making good money selling drugs, then maybe you're satisfying that. But what else are you putting into the world that that maybe you don't see? I think the momentum of the process is what keeps you going because the longer you stay sober, the more better honest relationships you have, the more opportunities you get at work because you're working harder and you're being honest and you're being accountable. Um, the more fun you have, 
so a lot of things. I mean, my life has changed pretty dramatically since getting sober. I moved to Utah. I bought a house. I have a good job. Um, I have a couple cats and a girlfriend, and, and I, I have a great life. And definitely these are not things that I would have if I was still using. So I think all of that keeps me going. 